Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like chicken to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, and this is episode number 42. So we're talking about the life, life, the universe, the and everything. Oh, that worked out. Um, but especially life, because we're in the middle of our series on the Ten Commandments, and we are talking about the Sixth Commandment today, which is thou shalt not kill. So we're going to talk about the metaphysics of life. Greg? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me take a step back and then talk about, um, about the word God. It means so many things to so many people. And even when we translate it into uh, theos, the Greek word, uh, as in polytheism or monotheism or pantheism, or I forget what all I've said now. We, we just kind of think, well, you know, God, pantheism, all is God, and monotheism, there's one God, polytheism, there's many gods, and God is just kind of God, you know. And, and Francis Schaeffer, I think, was the first to say, to blow the whistle on the field and say, um, no, we're, we're not using the word God in the same sense. When the polyist, polytheist speaks of the gods, many gods, he's talking about uh, primal forces of nature that come out of chaos and dissolve back into chaos and that may or may not have some kind of human persona. Uh, they may simply be anthropomorphized by their worshipers, but they are most certainly finite and limited in the scope of, of their authority. When the pantheist, the Hindus say, describes his religion, his God, the God there becomes the, the semi-sentient, non-sentient, not quite sure, universe in all of its parts, not, not as we see it, but as the, the true underlying reality, the, the great oneness, which is behind all the things that we think we perceive. And that's God, but that God is not personal, does not think, certainly does not speak or reveal himself, itself, herself. I remember when we come to monotheism, we look at oh, Judaism and, and Islam and Christianity, and we say, well, there at least finally when we say God, we're meaning the same thing. But we're not. Christianity speaks of an eternal self-sufficient God in whom communion is eternal. There are three persons in this Godhead, mm -hmm. all equal in glory, all uh, sharing and exhausting together the same divine essence, so that they're truly one and yet also truly distinct, so that they can they can talk, they can make promises to one another, make commitments to one another. Over against, say, Allah in Islam, who is not that whatever he is or it is, <laughs> Uh, not quite sure what's going on there, but it is a blind oneness that certainly does not love in any sense that we would think of love. Uh, it is it is a force of some sort. And so again, the theos here, the godness, is not the same, but it, it looks like it ought to be the same. We see, well, you know, just we're, it's just all versions of how we think about God. No, it's not at all. It's about how we think about ultimate reality and what we end up with is Christianity on one side, where this triune, self-commuting, self-identifying, absolute God is sufficient to himself, and yet nonetheless an overflowing joy and glory creates something outside of himself. And then there's everything else where there is a basic oneness, mm -hmm. and that basic oneness is matter, materialism, spirit, pantheism, or some interesting stab at some kind of monotheism where God creates out of necessity because he's lonely or insufficient or needs something, or it's just, you know, like yawning at something he does, and then it's all going to go away sometime. Uh, the universe may not, strictly speaking, be metaphysically part of God, but it's a necessary corollary of God. God makes it because he has to, because it's inevitable. And thus it is a projection or a natural act of God, and thus part, again, part of the basic oneness. So in all of these other worldviews, everything devolves back into this oneness. And then that brings us to the question of, 
life. The Bible speaks of God as the living God. Uh, and here we can think of begetting, we can think of communing, we can think of loving. These are things that go into life, joy, peace, rest, trust. These, these, these are living things. We look at the other systems and it's not there. We, we can get chemical reactions, we can get uh, illusory manifestations, we can get necessary operations, but none of these things are distinguishable from the basic oneness. In other words, in, in Christianity, life is special because it's something that belongs to God, and God gave it to something that's not part of him. He created a world that he didn't have to make. And he created living things. He created animals, and he created man in his image. And I see two hands up, so I'm going <laughs> to stop there and go first to Brian. Yes. Okay. Because uh, one of the things that just immediately came to mind is, um, especially in regards to uh, the specifically more Buddhist view of reality and forces and, and nature and all of this, the very first thing that popped to mind was a line from The Last Jedi about... Mm -hmm. You know, he tells her to reach out and feel the force, and he's like, "I I feel life, and I feel death, and and nature, and and humanity, or whatever you know, society, and, and what do you see in the middle of them? Balance. It's like, yeah, that's what the force is. The force is balance between all these things. And it's like, if anyway, the reason for bringing that up as a quote, <laughs> is twofold. One, I wanted to annoy people who don't like the movie, and two. <laughs> I like to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> Brian doesn't let me do that. I don't it's let so you do that. It's so annoying. <laughs> the second reason is actually relevant, which is if God is everything, then there's nothing particularly special about connecting with God. Yes. And like you were saying, connecting back to life, if if life isn't something gifted to us by a God who is outside of his creation, then there's no purpose in pursuing the, the um, preservation of life as opposed to the destruction of life, because both mm -hmm. of them are equally participatory in the God being. Yes. We're back to Thanos. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything has to, <laughs> to be. To pick there. another movie series that <laughs> sometimes we pretend doesn't exist. Emily, what were you yeah. going to say? I was going to bring up Mormonism, which... Okay at first blush might sound like it falls in the cracks between these two alternatives that we've set up between uh, the God of the Bible, who is life and begetting and loving and all these things. Um, and the worldview of all is one um, because Mormonism purports to have this God, the father, this, I don't know. Do they call him Jehovah or Yahweh? I'm not sure. Elohim. Heavenly father. Elohim. Elohim. Oh, they do. Elohim. Yeah, Jehovah yeah. is uh, Jesus. Okay. So, but what they have done ontologically is just push off the question one step further. Right. Because their gods beget other gods, and that's all that humans are, is temporarily enfleshed spirit beings that will then die and beget other gods and other gods and other gods. So fundamentally, even all of their gods are just more of the same stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's like when you hear evolutionary attempts to explain the origins of life on Earth and they go, well, it could have been uh, the result of accidental DNA left behind by aliens visiting. Right. Cool. Where what did the aliens, the aliens come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This doesn't help your case. You're not making the point you think you're making. <laughs> yeah. They're just escaping the full court press. Not to say that, okay, well, the aliens had more time and they, oh, I know they had a special revelation from a guy, oh, wait, um, <laughs> nope, another <can't> alien <laughs> <laughs> whom they mistook for some sort of deep, wait, that's the same. And so we begin the same backward regression into eternity and infinity, looking for a final hook to hang our coats on. And it's not there. Yes, something has to be eternal. But what that something is actually matters. And to say it's the impersonal, self-existent universe is to say that it's no higher than us. There's nothing transcendent, nothing to appeal to, no absolute, nothing beyond our circumstances. And, you know, when our circumstances stink, we're dust in the wind. 
And, and to pretty it up, as uh, one character in Babylon 5 tried once, we are star stuff. We are the universe made manifest, trying to figure itself out. Big appeal to Hegel there, but not Wait, too so far. From... Did Carl Sagan get that from Babylon 5 or the other <laughs> way around? I, I think they borrowed it from Carl Sagan. Okay. If not from Kansas, all we are is dust in the wind. <laughs> um, yeah, it sounds pretty. We're star stuff. You mean we got spat out of the heart of a ball of flaming gas? Mm, yeah, feels so well, special that, now. That <laughs> does explain a lot of politics. <laughs> <laughs> and all the hot air around yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, but that's that's where the non-Christian worldview is. Uh, well, there's only one. This has a lot of faces. It's where it leaves us. We why, why is life so special? You know, we we'll take a stand for this or that as Christians, and immediately someone will jump down our throats and say, "Don't you love people? Don't you care about life? Don't you this? Don't you?" That? Yeah, actually, we do. Why do you? Where mm -hmm. in your worldview is there an absolute that gives you any kind of leverage for for pointing a finger at us? Um, you don't think we care for animals. Great, we do actually, but why do you? You think that black lives matter. Well, as a matter of fact, all lives matter, but why do you say that? On what basis, on what authority, to, by appeal to what absolute? We have an answer, but it's one that lies outside the universe, not within the universe, because when your final court of appeal is all the people in the room, whoever has the most guns wins. <laughs> Whoever can elbow out the most room gets to tell the rest of us what to do for today, and then tomorrow will be someone else as the universe continues to unfold and comes to know itself. But there are no absolutes, and no one has a right, what does right mean anyway in this context, to judge by what standard anyone else. In fact, are, 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 the, are there other people? Are not we all manifestations of the great oneness? We're all molecular... Um, substance yes. in motion, energy particle extended. We're all manifestations of that great spiritual force or whatever. In the world. How do we even know it's spirit if we don't have matter to contrast it with? It's just blah. <laughs> I mean, pick a, pick, a, pick a phonetic sound and call it that because without anything to measure it by, we, we can call it whatever we want. And matter and spirit at this point become interchangeable. They're just the stuff, the junk, the gunk. Mm -hmm that is reality, if there is nothing outside of it, above it, that transcends it, that to which we can appeal and say, no, by this standard, in terms of this word, by this law, by his definition. And again, that brings us to God's self-revelation. Like, if we don't have anything to measure the world by, we have just the stuff, that which is. Mm -hmm. And when God introduces himself verbally, he says, I am that which I am. It's personal and it's real. And this person, and again, we come back to one of our favorite themes, at least it's been one of my favorite themes for the past few years now, the doctrine of the Trinity. Christians, of course, all acknowledge this. Uh, there's no one who claims to be a Bible-believing Christian, in, well, with any degree of... Okay, there are people who claim to be <laughs> Bible-believing Christians that deny the Trinity. We don't listen to them because for 2,000 years, the church has said, Trinity. And if a group comes along and denies it and yet claims to believe the Bible, we say cult, because this is the distinguishing hallmark of Christianity, the triune God. We know that, and we have a sense of some importance here in that we know Jesus has to be God, but it's not a doctrine that gets a lot of, of airtime these days. It's not something people think through in terms of its consequences. And one thing we have been doing in this, in this podcast, and particularly with the Ten Commandments, has been to try to to root all of God's revelation in, in who he is and, and who he is. We can't exhaust, but we, we know some things he said. Uh, he, he talks about himself in, in terms and words that we label person because there's understanding and relationship and communication and moral judgment and creativity, love, the things that we would normally attach to a person. And when we look at the Bible, Turns out the Bible says there are three persons, and yet there's only one God. And these are not three members of a club called God, <laughs> nor is it God broken into three parts, Potter, Shalism, Pathic, nor is <laughs> God 
evolving as a, a man might evolve from being a child to a young man to being an, an older, wiser man, or three activities. He's a, a son, and then he's a husband, then he's a father. There's a, a metaphysical oneness, a shared reality, a shared essence or being. So unity is eternal, but so is diversity. And that diversity is not an abstract diversity, it's a personal diversity. It's three interacting, communing, loving persons and that stands above and beyond everything. And Christianity appeals out of this world to him, to them, to that, and says, here's meaning. And there's life. He is life. And he's gifted us with life. We have plant life, which is more of a chemical thing. Uh, the Bible never speaks of plant life, of plants having the breath of life or sentience or consciousness. It only uses the word life metaphorically, but then animals who are said to be living souls. And next time, apparently, we're talking about pets and animals and things. Uh, but then above and above all that is man who is God's image and who is a living soul, a living soul who, who is and who bears God's image. And that's what makes human life so terribly important. But animal life, too, is important, but not as important. And so Christians have this scale of plants are nice, animals are cool, man walks with God. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't have to lose the plants or lose the animals because man is so special because God also made the other things and has a purpose for them in terms of his total plan for his universe. And, and we are not only not to go around destroying human life, animal life, plant life, just cause, but there is also the, the, the positive commandment of love to promote life. And Brian, I think you wanted to, you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I'll just read one of the Westminster Catechism questions and part of its answer, because it is a lengthy answer. The question is, which is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is, thou shalt not kill. And what are the duties required in the sixth commandment? Answer. The duties required in the sixth commandment are all careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others by resisting all thoughts and purposes, subduing all passions, and avoiding all occasions, temptations, and practices which tend to the unjust taking away the life of any. And so this is one of those kind of applications that are not explicitly stated, which kind of reasoning apophatically negatively from the statement itself if we're told thou shalt not kill cool that's that is a good thing to follow and if you're just following the letter that's all that you would really think of but there's more to it than that because it's more than just you know don't don't stab a guy don't shoot a person with the intent to kill them it's also don't willingly put yourself into that kind of situation in the first place and don't think in that way and don't allow your emotions and passions to arise in such a thought pattern because as we learn from our lord in the gospels even the very act of thinking hatefully towards your brother is murder in your heart but what you often hear from people who don't or who I shouldn't say they they don't like Christianity because they're fighting against it <laughs> is that oh there's just there's so many thou shalt nots I mean it's just it's annoying to listen to it you know there's just so much and it's just a big laundry list of thou shalt nots it's really not <laughs> there's uh, there's a lot more that has to do with do this and instruction in righteousness. Exactly. And I, I think that part of that comes from just the simple human factor that it's a lot less helpful to say what you're against. It doesn't really give you something to fight for. It's just giving you something to fight against. So having these positive commands understood from the negative commands is something that we should at least acknowledge and remember because it helps us recognize, you know, the morality isn't just not killing people. The morality is also helping people stay alive. Have you read Going Postal by Terry Pratchett? <laughs> I, I think that I saw the TV movie they did, and I didn't ever read the book myself. But I read Making Money, which was the sequel. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
the connection uh, would be the connection <laughs> is I, that I haven't read the the protagonist of Going Postal um, is a con man, um, and he's very affable, and you really you really get to like him as the story goes along. But he thinks of himself as morally good because you know it, it's not like he's stealing things that people need, and it's not like he's hurting anyone. Um, and he uh, he encounters a personage of a sort who knows his true occupation and uh and this person says to him you've killed 37.2 people or some crazy number like that with the with the decimal on it yes, yes and and he says what i i've never killed anyone that's horrible i would never do such a thing and the person says no that person that you stole from lost their job because they couldn't keep accounts straight and that's why their family starved and that's a death there and that's a death down the line. So thinking of people's livelihoods as involved in their lives and remembering that life and death isn't just you're either in the state of neutrality towards someone or you're committing violence against them is kind of Along the lines of what you're saying, I think. I think I see where you're you're making your connection. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is is it a clear connection? Because I'm <laughs> not sure. It. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Made sense to me. Yeah. All right. It is not enough that we be stocks and sticks and stones who do nothing. God requires of us. She said righteousness. Now the the negativity of all and, and Russian he has a a chapter in the Institutes of Biblical Law on the Negativity of the Law. There, there is a point, and it sort of depends upon the audience. For a society, God draws a huge circle or a, what do you call a ten-sided figure? A tenagon? Uh, <laughs> a decagon. 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 Um, and and each, at each point, there is a fence that says, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not, or remember, or honor. But within that, that, that decagon, within that circle, there's tremendous freedom. God does not, despite what people say about Christianity, God does not have a super long list that says, at 6 a.m. you will arise from your bed. At 6.01, your feet will hit the floor. At 6.02, you will proceed to the bathroom to brush your teeth. There's nothing like that in Scripture. There is no complicated list of thou shalt. There is, here are some boundaries. Don't cross them in, the, in, in between. There's freedom. Now, of course, that's not all there is. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about, of course, are the more general positive things like love your neighbor, mm -hmm. love your wife, provide for your family, work in God's creation, and many other things that, that we could put there that, but are, that are also generalizations. But in terms of a society, we, we tend to focus upon the negative commandments in terms of outward civil law. We really don't want civil law telling us a whole lot of thou shalt because thou shalt pay taxes. Well, see how good that goes. Um, <laughs> we, we, we tend to to have the negatives to allow for freedom. But when God speaks the positives to, have a lot more to do with the heart. Don't with they? the heart, yes. And that's exactly what that was. You took the words out of my mouth. Oh. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, the positives speak more to the heart, to our attitudes. But then they will need, they will need definition eventually. But the definitions vary so much on circumstances that then we also need the negatives to, to balance it out. Okay, here is this person I want to show love to them. So to love them, I will go steal my neighbor's car and give it to this person I love because that's really loving this person, right? No, you can't do uh, that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I really I really love this woman. So I will seduce her from her husband at... No, nope, can't do that. Nope. No. Okay. Well, she wants a job. So I'm going to make up this entire resume for her out of nothing, but it'll really get that job for oh, her. No. 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 You can just see the billiard ball bouncing around <laughs> the inside of the. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. So we, we, the positives like love. And, and love is a great example here. I don't know. They need definition. My, uh, my pastor last night, or my pastor emeritus, more specifically was was preaching on um, uh, our need for spiritual discernment. He was just giving all kinds of examples of crazy, stupid doctrines, philosophies, and, and slogans that people have. He said he's walking around the neighborhood, 
and he saw in his neighborhood a sign that listed all the things that family stands for. You've probably seen a sign like this. I've, I've seen a couple. Um, but one of the statements out of many was, love is love. That seems sort wow. of tautological to start <laughs> with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we celebrate diversity. Okay. What does that mean? What kind mean? of diversity? What kind of diversity? There is a sense of which Christians can say within God's creation, by his grace, in terms of his law. He made a world full of all kinds of what God himself is diverse. He's three. But if we don't have the boundaries of God's law, we go wacko with this, just as love is love. In this generation, love, I think, means I accept you just as you are. And the more perverse you are in how you are, the more I accept you to the point that I will not only tell other people they have to accept you, I will get mad at them when they don't, and I will lobby the government to give you money to continue being diverse. And anyone who doesn't accept this obviously is part of the problem and probably should be killed or sent to a mental institution, as the case may be. That seems to be what love means today. I'm not sure, because neither is anybody else. But if you try to cross somebody who's uh, living an alternate lifestyle, which is to say one contrary to God's law, you're going to get attacked for not being a loving person. But love needs definition. Love needs the law of God, both to tell you in general terms what it is, and also to tell you very specific way what it isn't, because we'll take it and run with it. We will do. We will break every one of the Ten Commandments in order to love somebody. And we'll pat ourselves on the back and tell everyone what good people they are. Uh, and the world will look at us and say, well, you're not loving because you have all these negatives. We actually have a definition for love. Thank you very much. And although it begins in, in the Godhead, and we can, we can look at the, the persons of the Trinity and their relationship, and we can speak of their truthfulness to one another, their transparency, their um, fidelity. They make promises and they keep them. Their shared communication their commitment, their, their giving of themselves to honor and glorify the other. Yet we still, for us, need some concrete instruction. And even taking God as our model, even taking Jesus as our model in his, in his incarnation here, there, there are still specifics we need. And so in exalting uh, love and a love of life, yeah, we have some rules. Because the alternative is everyone doing what's right in his own eyes, which is to say, whatever makes me feel good. And that's dangerous, mm -hmm. as we can see by looking at our city streets these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> when it comes to the moral law specifically, we all recognize that the moral law is the expression of God's being as morally upright and, and righteous and holy. And moreover, because we are told in Wow, I'm going to forget which epistle it's in. Uh, we are told, you know, God is love. For the sure. law, the moral law specifically, is loving. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not this hateful thing. And if you spent more than three seconds looking at it, you would realize <laughs> that. You know, yeah. it's not loving to kill another person. It's not loving to steal from them. It is not loving to commit adultery with them. And it is not loving to them to covet their house or their ox. Or in, in this day, I guess it would be their Lamborghini. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> and it's also not loving to disrespect your parents or to mm -hmm. not observe the Sabbath. These are loving towards God to respect and honor the things that he has commanded of us. But... The law is love, and it's not there, – there's no antithesis here. It's not, well, God loves us so much that he, he goes against his justice to save us. Yeah. It, that, that's not even anywhere If there. he could yeah. do that, yeah. Jesus didn't have to die. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. he wouldn't that, that is be the God gospel. he's described. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah there would, there would, that's a counter gospel. That's, that's – yeah, as you said, Emily, then Jesus – didn't have to die, and the whole gospel is a very sad joke on God's part. Mm -hmm. uh, on Jesus, yeah, son, didn't really want to tell you, but uh, he didn't have to go through all that. I just love him so much, I was going to let them in anyway. But you already went down there before I could tell you, so. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it tears the Trinity apart. It tears God apart. Which, you know, when you try setting God against, against himself, that is inevitably what will happen. <laughs> uh, and you can think here... Speaking of animals, one just keeps attacking me from <laughs> Hello, the back right Lucy. now. 
Yeah. This is Lucy. This is the new Hello. kid in the house. Um, two things. One, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Paul, on a couple of occasions, sums up the law. There, love your neighbor as yourself. If there's any other... Ouch! The cat just attacked me. Oh, no. <laughs> Ouch! Get off my pack. I love you, dude. I'm kidding. Um, anyway... Um, <laughs> <laughs> in, 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 in Romans 13, for instance, and in Galatians, Paul says that the whole law is, is, is summarized. If there's any other commandment, he lists, he lists a bunch of the Ten Commandments. If there's anything else, it's summarized in love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill toward his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Mm. Love for neighbor, love for God, they're coextensive. They, all, they both encompass all Ten Commandments from different perspectives. Uh, but yeah, love, love speaks in, in absolute standards, in rules, in laws. And we hate law because law is, as you said, thou shalt or thou shalt not. And we don't want anyone telling us what to do because we're rebels fallen in Adam. And the moment someone says thou shalt not, our hackles go up and we say, says who? Well, that's the issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to go back to, something that you, when you were reading from the Westminster Standards, you use you they use the word unjustly. I think that's really important mm -hmm. because uh, in, in our age we try to wrap it all together, and Christians have been guilty of this. Mm -hmm. What what tends to killing people? Well, guns tend to kill people. Nuclear warfare tends to kill people. Capital punishment. Capital punishment tends to kill people. So to be truly fully pro life. And there was a book a while back by a gentleman who's, whom I will not name, but who made a lot of money talking about rich Christians in a productive society and how they should feel guilty about it. Uh, wanted to continue that theme by saying, you know, if you're really, you, you, people are talking about, about being pro-life with respect to abortion. All right, well, fine, but let's be really pro-life. And that's kind of where he went. And, and the world does the same thing. But again, we have to reckon with God's justice, God's righteousness. The God who said thou shalt not kill is the God who established the death penalty for murderers. The God who said uh, love your enemy is the same God who said if there's someone in your house at night and you can't see because it's dark, you can kill him dead. And it's not the greatest I, It's not the greatest thing, but it's legitimate and, it's, and you're legally innocent and you won't be punished. And there's a protection uh, that results from that. Yeah, you have the right to protect your family and preserve their lives. Which well, is the most just, loving thing you can do yeah. for them. But and if we, against, if we all, let me just finish this out. If we all yeah. laid down our guns, then, see, that's the problem. If we all stopped having guns and, 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 and belligerent attitudes, then all the bad people would stop being bad and that would fix everything. If, so like, put down our actually, guns, <laughs> if all of us put down our guns, then there'll be a very large increase in clubbing deaths. <laughs> well, I was just going to bring up London, where guns have been outlawed for just ever. They mm. recently surpassed New York in murder rates. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and they, people use knives. Like, yeah. <laughs> It's unsurprising. Now they have knife restrictions as well. Yeah. <sighs> not a joke. Yeah. Broomsticks will be next. <laughs> I, was, I forgot bats. what I was going to yeah. say. But, but you, you have a thought, Brian? I, for, I was going to say something, and then I completely, I've completely lost it. Oh, that's what it was. It was about, um, you know, all we need to do is uh, purify mankind's environment, and suddenly mm -hmm. they will no longer be evil. Right. And there is a basic romanticism behind all of these, these, manif these manifestations we're seeing that say... People are dying. People are being hurt. Animals are being killed. Planets being polluted. If we just perfected man's environment, then man would stop doing these these bad way. Why is it bad exactly? These wicked. Why is it? What does that mean? Anyway, stop doing these things we don't approve of for whatever reasons we don't approve of them, and everything would be better because you know man's not evil. He's even kind of basically good. Yeah, but what's happening? with the uh, the next phase of this romanticism. It was all it was all humanistic. Man's great, man's wonderful, man's perfectible. Uh, somewhere we lost that because now, yeah, man's a cancer, man's the culprit, man's the bane, man's the curse on the planet. What we really need to do is simply exterminate the human race 
because the planet and its ecology is so much more important than we are. We aren't worth living or perpetuating, but the planet and the animals and the plants, that's important. And we have all of these uh, clubs within the green movement. They're, they're basically, their roots are in socialism and in, in um, the whole ecological movement and romanticism. But that's where they're coming from. It's all right to kill people for the sake of the planet. The planet's alive, and that life is greater than man's life. So again, we're falling back on a sort of pantheism where nature itself is the living thing and more important than the parts. But again, we have to stand back and say, more important by whose standard? How are you making this appeal? You obviously have a moral concern and you have an absolute. Where in the world, where in your worldview does this come from? As Christians, we can say we have a reason not to pollute the planet. We have a reason to take that dog we accidentally ran over immediately to the vet and try to get treatment for him, even though he's not our dog. Uh, we do those things, but, but we have a reason for it. And it's a religious one, Brian. There's also a, a less extreme version of this kind of eco ism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, yeah, which is basically to say, well, the planet's dying and we need to stop the planet from dying so that the the future is better for ch for humans for right. our our ancestors and Descendants. you kind of have to wonder it's, okay why yeah. it's the same question why is that something that matters why right. why do your children's lives matter at all and is really the only thing that you have to justify that is like an emotional argument which is well they're my children and i like them and it's like, yeah, yes. you should like your children, but why do you like them in the first place? But you, you think it's some kind of evolutionary passing on your genes thing. What value is there in that? Yeah. Well, the universe is presupposed to move this way, so I'm just going with the main current. Cool. That explains why you're doing it. It doesn't need to give it a moral justification because there's no morality here. River flows downstream because rivers flow downstream. We don't talk about the righteousness of the flow. Nor do we talk about the sin of those who try to swim against it. It's just stuff that happens. And well, it depends so you, on which romantic poet you're reading, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You, 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 you have your emotional attachment for your kids. Okay. I don't. What does that say about me? What happens if your kids annoy me? Can you say it's wrong for me to kill them? And if so, by what standard? And again, now what, two things. One, Christians have a standard. Two, are we saying that, that all unbelievers live that out. Of course not, because they're the image of God, and there's the point of the argument. They live as if Christianity is true, far more than they would like to think or admit. They live as if there are absolutes. They live as if love and life have meaning and purpose. They just can't tell you out of their own system why that is, mm. what it is, or how it works. And when we try, they yell at us and get mad, because they want the fruit they want the blessings to a degree, but they don't want the rules. They want to live their own lives in their own terms while still feeling nice about themselves and getting along with everyone else. So their world has some kind of unity and, and pattern and rhythm that you can, you can make work and you can have fun in. But absolutes, mm, that's a problem. So we've spent a lot of time talking about what doesn't work about trying to take care of the planet or getting that out of its right place in our priorities. But let's flip over and talk about the other side of the coin, which is the first task given to man was that of a gardener. And mm -hmm. we were put on this earth to take dominion, to cultivate, to dress and keep, um, to care for one another and for animals and for plants. So uh, I had a train of thought and then there were no more rails. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's a, there's a number of ways you might have been going with that. <laughs> One could be sin. And that, that's probably the inevitable. We can ask the question as, as Christians, but sin, didn't that destroy all that, make it all impossible? So now, you know, ecology and gardening and aesthetics and animals, that may be a nice hobby for people who like it, but this really can't be important. What's important is the spiritual things in life. Uh, <laughs> no. 
No. In <laughs> fact, cut paste our entire discussion on the sociology of dominion right here. That's episode number. I don't remember what number it was. As a as a very quick side note, I've been listening to uh, the audiobook for Tom Holland's Dominion. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was kind of giving just this brief overview of of some of the early church's history when it came to battling heresies. And like at each one, he was like, yeah, this guy thought this. And also and then he would just like basically say something that was functionally Gnosticism. And I was like, ah, yes, <laughs> the one thing underwriting all of the heresies. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because we don't want to be creatures. We want to be God. And the moment we want to be God, we leave the creation behind and it's beneath our contempt. And so all these people may say that because all is God, we, we're going to take care of nature. But that throws us back on this, this fast monism. If all, is, if all is all, what does it matter? Or as Charlie Manson once said, if God is one, what is wrong? If, if, if everything is just an expression of the, the total unity of what is, how can you say anything is wrong? And why, why should we follow you in your love for the planet and your green philosophy and even rescuing a dog. Why does it matter? You like to do it? Well, fine, then you go do it. But why are you trying to impose it on us and make us feel guilty? Whatever that means in your system for not snapping in line and following you. Now, as Christians, we can we can go back and say, in, in answer to the question, didn't sin derail it? No, sin did not derail it. Jesus came into the world to save the world. And to save man in all of man's relations, and that includes the whole creation that was subordinated to man and that fell under the curse with him, but of which Paul says the whole creation uh, waits, groaning, travailing, waiting for the resurrection, waiting for the restitution of all things. The creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. And so God now works through things, nature, creation, little kitties who are now sitting here and being nice to me, um, <laughs> to sanctify us. Little kittens are a good example. This cat's been running all over the house and tearing up my wife's couch and chair. And let me smile and love the cat anyway, because she belongs to our daughter and also because the cat's kind of cute and because God puts animals in our house. And, and we just don't take them out in the backyard and shoot them because they're annoying. But God has entrusted all of these things to us and he teaches us about how we relate to them and one another and to him who's their maker and who providentially brings us brings them into our lives at times we don't expect and aren't necessarily ready for so that we can grow in our relationship to him that we can learn to love we don't we don't throw out the creation and one day god will redeem the whole of creation so christians are poised to to have to be a voice for ecology uh and for what we call nature for the the lower creation but it has a subordinate place. Man, as God's image, is the superior, but part of that superiority is taking care mm -hmm. of his the stewardship. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not our job as superior should destroy and trample underfoot, but to love and to nurture just as God does to us. That is a great point to switch over to recommendations. And that, in fact, leads into my recommendation. Mm -hmm. which is the movie Paddington, which I adore. <laughs> One of the things I love about it is that it juxtaposes two views of Dominion. Um, I'm not sure if the writers knew that they were doing this in such a way that it would speak thusly to me, but <laughs> I, I see it and it's every time I watch the movie, because I do so repeatedly, because it is a favorite of mine, every time I watch it, I see it more clearly. If you're familiar with the books, Paddington, they're a very charming set of children's books about a bear, a from talking Darkest bear Peru. from Darkest Peru. Yes. Um, he is sent to England for one reason and another. You should read the book to get the whole story. But he has to move to, to London and he's all alone and he has to find a home. And he's been told that long ago in London, children were put on railway platforms to find homes when it was, there was a time of war and danger. And so he's standing on the train platform looking for a home because he has nowhere else to go. Um, so he gets adopted into this family and they're not used to having a bear in the house, <laughs> um, but they're, they're learning to love him, to use the words that you just used. Um, they're learning to love him. And 
they sort of, they bond and lots of adventures and they're trying to figure out how he knew to come to London, all of this stuff. Meanwhile, there is a taxidermist who needs a specimen of a talking bear. And she, in fact, has a grudge against this particular talking bear for reasons which you will discover. Ooh, I need to see this movie now. I didn't know that was... You do, yes. and it's adorable. It's it, completely I, adorable. I didn't know it departed so far from the original children's book, but that's okay. <laughs> it has all of the original charms, I think. Okay. I think. But with Which this me, delightful I need to go... Dominion arc thrown in there. I should go read the book at some point, or books. Yeah. yeah. yeah in, in, in another book, he starts his own garden. So <laughs> That's the delightful. Takes, the, board, the bear takes Dominion. Yeah. Brian, what's your what's your recommendation? Cool. Um, I'm going to not recommend a book this time because I thought of something that wasn't a book. Um, and I'm going to recommend an action, which is oh. decluttering. Ooh, yes, yeah. my uh, favorite. I'm about five months late or six months late for spring cleaning, but I did it anyway. And uh, I went through my, my closet and... I probably got rid of it at least a solid 30% of articles of clothing that were in there, uh, along with more than 50% of old pocket knives that for some reason I was still holding on to. And <laughs> there's a cat. She came up to look at your faces. Oh, adorable. And I realized you could not see her. Anyway, Aww. go ahead. And then I'm also I'm still going through the process actually uh, this week as well, just with some of my other belongings, part partially out of necessity since I am planning to move <laughs> out of state and it would be nice to not carry things I won't use, but yes. also just because there are things that I, I I have in my house that are mine that I have not touched in seven years and there is no reason for me to hold on to them in such a case. So decluttering it it is a great way to. Practice stewardship over your belongings. There you go. Yeah. Wow. I'm I, a big I fan. Am, I am impressed, and I hope a lot of people listen to that because, yeah, I won't say why. Okay. <laughs> also, uh, because there are places for it, think about donating them to Goodwill because that helps mm -hmm. people too. That's that's what we do. If Goodwill will take our clutter. <laughs> they, they usually do, but sometimes they why not take that. Um, my recommendation, and I'm hoping I haven't already recommended it, but if I have, I have. It's a little book on education written by the man who was my mentor, my teacher, uh, C.W. Powell Jr., and it's called A Nail in a Sure Place, Bible Proverbs for Anyone Who Teaches. Uh, and it is certainly not just for teachers. It's for parents. It's for people who work with young people. It's for people who simply want to communicate and not be jerks and idiots, which one would hope would be all of us. <laughs> but he he walks through uh, a number of um, proverbs from the book of and um, makes application to the life of a teacher. My favorites, I think, are finding the ideal ox, if you can place the proverb for that one, uh, of which the point is, if you're going to get something done, you're going to make a mess. Deal. Mm -hmm. um, don't don't let the mess part, and then, you know, don't let the mess part stop you from, you know, you're going to clean it up later, you're going to declutter later, but don't let the fact that a, a mess is going to happen stop you. And the other one, building character or grinding a fool. Hmm. You know, you, uh, oh, what is it? I can't quote it exactly. Basically, you, you grind in a, a fool in a mortar with a pestle, yet still will not his foolishness depart from him. Hmm. The point being here again, changing man's environment doesn't change his character. And it doesn't work in the classroom. It doesn't work in a larger political setting. It doesn't work in the church. You cannot apply external penalties or encouragements or restrictions laws, rules, taboos, and think that that's going to give you a new person. Only the gospel produces new people. Uh, in the case we haven't mentioned that in all that we said today, life is the fruit of Christ in the gospel. Mm -hmm. He is eternal life, and he is God, he is life come into this world. And when we try to take him and then add something to him, we don't get life. We get corruption and death. Mm -hmm. Because what will you add to life to make it more living? 
think about that because the answers <laughs> would get scary really fast. Anyway, A Nail in a Sure Place by Dr. C.W. Powell. It should be available on Amazon, I believe. All right. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. This has been a blast. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters and our faithful listeners. We really appreciate you. Uh, if you would like to join in the conversation, give us your thoughts. Tell us where you think we left something out or didn't go far enough or went too far. Let us know what you think. Uh, send us an email. Haltingtowardsion at gmail.com is our address. Uh, you can like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel if that's your thing. Follow us on Goodreads. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.